Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We welcome, of course, those who join us on our heritage.org website at this time. Would ask our guests here in house if you'll be so kind to check that cell phones have been turned off as we prepare to begin. And of course, we will post today's program on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference. And we remind our internet viewers on all these occasions that you can send questions or comments at any time to us at speaker at heritage.org related to this program. Hosting our guest today is Darren Baxt, who is research fellow in agricultural policy in our Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies. He writes about agricultural subsidy, property rights, environmental policy, food labeling, and other related issues. Before joining us two years ago, he was a policy counsel for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, where he focused on regulatory reform as well as food and agriculture policy. Previously, he served as Director of Legal and Regulatory Studies for seven years at the John Locke Foundation of North Carolina, where he concentrated on po property rights and environmental policy. Please join me in welcoming Darren Bax. Darren? Thank you, John. Um, I want to thank everybody here for coming out, and I want to thank everybody who's watching the program online. On April 21st, 2014, the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers published their Waters of the United States proposed rule, rule in the Federal Register. The agencies have said that the rule is just a clarification and isn't expanding any of their powers, and it's not that big of a deal. Now, maybe I'm cynical, uh, but numerous organizations decided, you know, maybe we should just look into the rule. And this may come as a shock, but the rule is not exactly what the agency, agency said it was. And the EPA, in particular, has not liked any of the criticism that they have received. EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy has dismissed some public concerns about the rule as ludicrous and silly. The agency has a campaign trying to get support for the rule, and they've used video and social media to do that. And they asked the question, do you choose clean water? As if, if you don't support the rule, you support dirty water. To help make sense of the rule and to kind of separate fact from fiction, we're doing this panel today. And, and the game plan is this. I'm going to make some brief remarks providing some background about the rule. And then I'm going to turn, over, turn it over to our panelists, uh, Don Parrish from the American Farm Bureau Federation and also Reed Hopper from the Pacific Legal Foundation. They're, each of them will present for about 10 minutes, and then we'll also discuss after that what we think Congress needs to do to address the, the WOTUS rule. And then there, of course, will be plenty of time for questions and answers. So just providing some background, all right, what is the Waters of the United States rule? What is WOTUS? Okay, under the Clean Water Act, the federal government has jurisdiction over navigable waters. And then the statute further defines that as the waters of the United States, including the territorial seas. This definition of waters of the United States is critical <clears throat> because it clarifies what waters can be regulated by these agencies. And I, in some ways, I actually think we do a disservice by always focusing on the waters of the U.S. component and not the navigable waters term. Because, in fact, under the Clean Water Act, the, the, the actual water is the navigable water. And I think agencies and the court often lose sight of the fact that it's about navigable waters. So why is the rule such a big deal? The EPA and the court have a history of seeking to drastically expand their power under the Clean Water Act. Their power grabs have been shot down twice in just over a decade. Uh, in 2001, in a case called Solid Waste Agency in Northern Cook County versus the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and that's referred to as a Swank case. And in 2006, in Rapanos versus United States. And as you may know, a court not deferring to an agency's interpretation of a statute is really a miracle. Um, so I, I guess we can thank these agencies for two miracles. Um, now the agencies are back again with this proposed rule trying to regulate almost any water possible. Okay, so they regulate almost every water possible. Why does that even matter? Well, if a water is covered under the Clean Water Act, 
in other words, a jurisdictional water, a property owner might need to secure a permit if engaging in certain activities that might impact those waters. The Clean Water Act doesn't just cover someone dumping toxic waste into pristine water. If you kick sand into a jurisdictional water, that could require a permit. Normal activities from farming to building a home could be affected. People's livelihoods could be affected. And also, we're not just talking about water bodies in any sense that most of us would think of as a water body. A, in, in many instances, we might really be talking about land, at least from our perspective, most people's pers perspective. We could look at something that's really land and actually it really would be a water under the proposed rule. And that will be discussed further by the panelists. If you're a property owner, you may just simply decide, you know what, I'm not going to engage in certain activities because the cost and time of securing a permit isn't worth it. The rule is so vague that many property owners may not even know that their property has a jurisdictional water because its existence will often be far from clear and won't even be clear to the EPA and the Corps. As more waters are covered, property owners will need to get more permits and this means more restrictions on the use of property. And that is an attack on our property rights. The one, one issue I want to address before I turn it over to the panel is the science issue and the kind of the flawed process that went into developing this pr proposed rule. The EPA assembled a scientific advisory board to review a draft report that they had developed that was titled The Connectivity of Streams and Wetlands to Downstream Waters a review and synthesis of the scientific evidence. According to the EPA itself, this is them saying this, this report, when finalized, will provide the scientific basis needed to clarify Clean Water Act jurisdiction. So in January 2015, the report was in fact finalized. In a fact sheet announcing the release of the report, the EPA stated, now final, this scientific report can be used to inform future policy and regulatory decisions, including the proposed clean water rule being developed by EPA's Office of Water and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. There's a slight problem, though. The proposed rule was developed before the scientific report was finalized. Imagine if agencies can get away with this type of process. Government agencies could develop proposed rules with limited support or zero support, and then use reports and studies after the fact to validate what the agencies have already proposed. At least now they pretend to use sound science before the fact, maybe deciding to make it clear to everyone that science really isn't informing this rule is EPA's way to promote transparency. So what's the latest? At the start of April, just this April, EPA and the Corps sent the a final rule to the Office of Management and Budget for OMB's review. A final rule theoretically could be published at any time, and I mean, literally it could. It probably would be not tomorrow, it'd probably be, I'd imagine, sometime in the summer, but it could be sooner. The House Energy and Water Appropriations Bill has a provision in it that would, would uh, prohibit the use of funds for implementing the Waters of the United States rule. There's legislation that may be considered today in the House called the Regulatory Integrity Protection Act, which is H.R. 1732. It would require the withdrawal of the rule and create a process for the development of a new rule. And some legislation is also on the way as well. So there's certainly many legislative approaches out there. Um, it's going to be through the appropriations process and also standalone legislation. So we'll discuss that as well soon. Bottom line is that it's kind of insulting to for the EPA to say it's a choice about really clean water. Um, it's really a choice between this rule, that's a federal power grab, and property rights, state rights, and, and by the way, the Clean Water Act recognizes the state rights and respects state rights, and states have been completely ignored in this proposed rule. It's also critical if we're going to have a rule for it to be consistent with the Constitution and the statute itself, the Clean Water Act. So now let me introduce our panel. And let me introduce them and then they'll kind of get started. First, Don Parrish, who's closest to me, will discuss the scope of the rule, including what waters the rule 
would really cover. Don Parrish is the Senior Director, Regulatory Relations for the American Farm Bureau Federation's Public Policy Team in Washington, D.C. His primary area of responsibility at the American Farm Bureau is Clean Water Act. He currently chairs the Waters Advisory Co Advocacy Coalition, sorry, whose purpose is to prevent the expansion of the regulatory definition of waters in the United States. Don also chairs the Agricultural Nutrient Policy Council. AMPC is made, made up of agricultural organizations that want to strengthen our ability to work effectively on nutrient-related policy and regulatory issues important to the agricultural community. And then next, uh, Reed Hopper will discuss how the agencies are going way beyond existing Supreme Court precedent. Mr. Hopper is a principal attorney with the Pacific Legal Foundation. And by the way, I forgot to mention this, I think. I do want to stress, I want to thank Pacific Legal Foundation for co-hosting this event. Um, he oversees the Pacific Legal Foundation's Endangered Species and Clean Water Act litigation. Prior to joining the foundation in 1987, Mr. Hopper served as both an environmental protection officer and hearing officer in the U.S. Coast Guard enforcing the Clean Water Act in the Gulf Coast. Mr. Hopper has managed large industrial waste programs and written in numerous compliance standards. At the foundation, Mr. Hopper has litigated precedent-setting precedent environmental and land use cases, including the landmark, landmark case of Rapanos versus the United States, and more recently, Sackett versus EPA in the US Supreme Court. Now, I'm gonna turn it over to Reed Hopper. Uh, no, sorry, I'm gonna turn it to Don. Thank you, Darren. Uh, real quickly, guys, I'm going to do pretty quickly a run through of what I consider the fine print of this proposal and why I think EPA is going to expand their jurisdictional reach. And, and there's a real controversy about, well, we're just clarifying or are we actually expanding? And, and I don't think the, the agency has ever really been held accountable for that, that issue of is it just clarification or is it expanding because they always talk about uh, protecting the upper reaches of something, and, and that of something is, is a real question. Um, I want to start by just focusing your attention on three really important definitions that really talk about the regulatory footprint of the Clean Water Act, and that's tributaries, adjacent waters, and other waters. And, and we're going to look at this, hopefully. <clears throat> huh. Let's see. tributaries. Uh, they didn't use the word some. They used the word all. Features, including ditches, that could contribute flow to downstream waters. So, you, you know, when the courts have to look at the terms all and features that could contribute flow, that's pretty broad. Uh, that's number one. Number two, adjacent waters brings to mind some kind of spatial concept but they really didn't put a limiting concept into place. And it's all, all adjacent waters, not some, not those that are within a certain spatial reach. It's all, including all waters in a floodplain and a riparian area. And then three other waters, again, a concept where they bring two new themes to bear, aggregation and similarly situated. Uh, themes that they really don't flesh out very well, either in the rule or in the preamble. So when you look at all tributaries, all adjacent waters, and then all waters that are similarly situated or could be aggregated together, it's pretty clear that the agencies are trying to give themselves a lot of deference. And really deference that I think put the landowner at a real at a real disadvantage. I, I want to bring that home with some specific language that's in the proposal. Uh, you would think that the agencies would define the term water very prominently in their regulation, but this definition is in a footnote, and it basically says that water is more than H2O. It's the system, it's the chemicals, it's the biology, it's whatever the agencies want it to be, basically, and, and it is exceedingly broad. Uh, tributary. 
the longitudinal surface feature that results from the directional surface water movement and sediment dynamics demonstrated by the presence of bed bank bottom lateral boundaries and other indicators of ordinary high water mark. In some regions of the country where there are very low gradients, where the ground's flat, the banks of the tributary may be low or even disappear at times. You know, that's details. And, and I want to focus your attention on ordinary high water mark just a minute because it is really prominent in this proposal as to what constitutes a stream or what constitutes one of these features that could contribute flow. And what's interesting to us is that should have been part of this rulemaking. But as a result, not even being a part of this rulemaking, it was part of an ongoing effort to revise guidance documents that were completely separate and apart from this rulemaking. So if you look at the fine print, within the proposal as to what constitutes an ordinary high water mark, you know, it's a line on the shore. The shore of what? Land where the water runs. And you can see indicators vary region to region. It's extremely broad. Tributaries began where channels began. And I'm going to show some pictures about this in just a minute. That's, that's pretty specific. Agencies said all tributaries categorically are in, not some, but all, just to reinforce that. This is one that I think didn't get as much play in the, in the proposal as it probably should have, and this is this concept of other waters, similarly situated aggregated waters, and they talk about other waters can be biologically connected. Reed, I guess, glancing geese. Uh, connectivity varies over time. Connectivity occurs on a gradient. Uh, they're similarly situated, and they can have effect on water quality, and obviously they occur in watersheds. So really, as Darren pointed out, no limiting concept here, just concepts that broaden or give EPA a license. Think about that. We think of the term navigable as being a limit to federal jurisdiction. The agencies view it as a license to do anything on the landscape to protect them. Um, we think this map occurred in the proposal, uh, and you can see the dark areas around the coastline where people live and the, you know, the heartland of the country where we try to produce food, fiber, and fuel. Um, we think the agencies are going to teeing up, they're teeing up the process of calling all other waters within these shaded areas waters of the U.S., even if they're isolated interstate waters. That's pretty much a direct, in direct conflict with the Supreme Court cases. I'm sure Reed will say more about that. Uh, lastly, before I show you some pictures, what does it say about a proposal? That if they have to explicitly exclude artificial irrigated areas, artificial lakes, ponds, artificial reflecting pools, swimming pools, and ornamental waters, with this caveat, are not WOTUS if they're excavated in dry land. That tells you that the proposal is really really broad. Um, we also know from two really, I think, critical talking points that the administrator has been using over time is that, you know, you don't need a permit. If you didn't need a permit before, you won't need one now. Now, we've tried to pin the administrator and the Office of Water down on this issue very, very closely. And the only thing we can conclude after trying to pin those down is that they believe a lot of people need permits now that aren't getting them. They believe people are breaking the law. They're discharging without Section 402 permits, or they are discharging dredge and fill material without 404 permits. And that, you know, they should have had them before, but we're going to make sure they have them in the future. Uh, the last one, when it comes to, you don't have anything to worry about. You know, a broad regulatory footprint is really not a big deal because, you know, if there's some exemptions out there, and as long as you don't pollute or destroy a water, you're okay. The problem is the issue of pollute and destroy can be very, 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 it's basically anything but walking and riding a bicycle uh, through some of these areas. And, and really, you know, in terms of farmers and ranchers, when you're talking about our guys owning, operating, and trying to, you know, make a living on roughly 85% of the property in this country, this brings it home because there are economic consequences associated with these kinds of statements and the kind of regulatory footprint that the Clean Water Act is going to have. Uh, not only in trying to seek a permit, 
because there are no rights in the Clean Water Act for a permit. If you need a permit, you can apply for one. The agency doesn't have to grant one. So that's technically a veto of a land use activity. We're going to regulate where channels begin. There's one in Iowa. There's one in Tennessee. Another one in Tennessee. Another one in Tennessee. The first three were clearly agricultural applications. This one cost the Tennessee Department of Transportation about a half million dollars to clean up. Comment period, as Darren said, opened on April 21st, 2014. Comments closed November 14th. EPA received over a million comments. 20,000 of them have been posted on the website. Roughly 3,000 were substantive. Just a comment. Anybody in this room, I like clean water. Did that support the rule or not? Thousands. Would it surprise you that there were comments that come into the, to the docket from 75 different countries, including Iran, Russia, and China? You know, they'd be more than happy to tank our economy and tie us up into knots. So think about that. And yes, American citizens can live abroad and submit comments, but that's pretty far reaching and amazing. What if I told you from a substantive standpoint, 36 states indicated that EPA should withdraw this rule, but only seven states supported it. What if I told you that only seven counties across the country supported this rule? What if I told you that only 20 cities supported this rule? What if I told you only 50 businesses supported this rule? Everything else was resoundingly up, everybody else was resoundingly against this rule. Anybody that cared to read the details. 900,000 comments fit on four type single state, single space pages. They were a result of 183 different point and click campaigns. 76,000 were based on the Twitter account of Organizing for America, 76,000. Now, I don't want to diminish anyone's voice, but if you're an agency and you're tasked with adhering to the Administrative Procedures Act and looking at the substantive issues that are associated with this comment period, does a point and click campaign equal comments submitted by state attorney generals, state governors, county governments, as well as substantive comments from the regulated community. I think it's important to balance out how those comments pan out and how the agencies review it. I also want to tell you, and Darren alluded to this too, it concerns us when our concerns, when we're trying to go out to our grassroots here at the Farm Bureau and talk about what we think are the real substantive aspects of this rule and have the administrator or the administration call them ludicrous. Question the validity of those comments specifically as we think that's more or less suppressing the ability of our members to make comments. We also question whether the agency can actually lobby itself because the agency was actually out trying to gin up, get the public in a froth so that they would send in comments like this. So we know the agencies can't lobby Congress, but can they lobby themselves? And I think they did in this case. Thank you. When it comes to the Clean Water Act, the federal government is the biggest lawbreaker in the country. That's a bold statement, but I think it's borne out by the facts because the Supreme Court 
has already ruled that the scope of this regulation is invalid. In Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County, the 2001 Supreme Court case, the Supreme Court held that the Corps of Engineers could not regulate isolated water bodies, even if they were used for habitat, giving three reasons. Number one, such waters are not inseparably bound up with open waters, and to regulate such waters would read the term navigable right out of the act. Number two, the regulation of ponds, pits, pools, and mudflats would necessarily impinge on state powers to regulate local land and water use and raise serious constitutional questions about the Commerce Clause and the federal-state balance. And number three, Congress expressed no clear intent in the Clean Water Act to regulate isolated water bodies. To the contrary, the court said, Congress expressly stated that it recognized that the states have the primary responsibility and rights to protect, preserve, and control local land and water use. However, the uh, proposed rule uh, would cover these isolated water bodies as either adjacent or other waters in direct contravention of that Swank decision. If that were not enough, five years later in Rapanos versus United States, all nine justices on the court acknowledged that isolated water bodies were off limits to federal regulators based on their previous decision in, the, in Swain. This alone is sufficient to invalidate the core and EPA proposed rule, but there's more. In Rapanos, the Corps argued that it could regulate any and all tributaries to a downstream navigable water, regardless of how remote or inconsequential the flow or the effect on actual navigable waters. But a majority of the Court disagreed. The four justices in the plurality authored by Justice Scalia said, in sum, on its only plausible interpretation, the phrase the waters of the United States does not include channels through which waters flow intermittently or ephemerally or channels that periodically provide drainage for rainfall. The Corps' expansive interpretation is thus not based on a permissible construction of the statute. Justice Kennedy was just as clear when he said that the regulation of all tributaries would leave wide room for the regulation of drains, ditches, and streams remote from any navigable, in fact, water and could not be adopted as a standard for determining jurisdictional waters. In other words, five justices, a majority on the court, held that the Corps and the EPA could not categorically regulate all tributaries. Inexplicably, as you just heard, the proposed rule adopts this very definition of tributaries that the High Court expressly determined the Clean Water Act does not cover. But the rule goes even further and asserts jurisdiction over riparian areas floodplains, and water bodies uh, <clears throat> that um, have no other connection to, uh, to navigable waters other than their nearness. And as you have heard under the infamous footnote three, the term waters and water bodies do not <clears throat> refer solely to the water contained in the aquatic systems, but to the systems as a whole, including any associated physical, chemical, or biological features. This seemingly innocuous language can be interpreted to include runoff, dry land, man-made structures, as well as any flora or fauna. What isn't a chemical, physical, or biological feature of the aquatic system? With the stroke of a pen, the Corps and EPA have not only read the term navigable out of the act, but also the term waters. 
Contrary to the Supreme Court decision in Riverside, Bayview, Swank, and Rapanos, under the new rule, navigable waters has absolutely no meaning. So when these agencies claim that the rule does not expand the scope of federal authority and that it is in complete consistency with the Supreme Court precedent, you can call it what it is. This claim is as false as it is absurd. It should be exposed and opposed. But who cares? Isn't this just an academic debate that affects big polluters? Well, that's exactly what the Sacketts thought until the EPA slapped them with a compliance order for putting gravel on their essentially dry half-acre lot to build a modest three-bedroom house in a built-out subdivision near Priest Lake, Idaho. The EPA claimed that the lot contain wetlands subject to regulation under the Clean Water Act and that the Sackett should have gotten a permit from the Corps of Engineers. For this failure, the Sacketts were ordered to restore the property to its original condition at a cost uh, exceeding the value of the lot, to fence it off and monitor it for three years, to provide off-site mitigation, to pay a penalty and allow 24 access, 24 seven access to the site by the government. If they did not comply with these demands, they would be subject to civil fines up to $75,000 per day. And adding insult to injury, they could not challenge the government's assertion of authority without doing all of the above. The Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals recently said that the Clean Water Act is unique in that it is the only law in which one must hire an expert to determine whether the law applies to you or your land. And of course, the government need not accept your expert's opinion. Based on their expert's opinion, the Sacketts believed that their property did not contain wetlands subject to federal control. We at Pacific Legal Foundation took the case to the Supreme Court, arguing it would be a due process violation if this young couple could not seek immediate review in court to challenge EPA's overzealous application of the law. Fortunately, in 2012, all nine justices on the court agreed. A compliance order is, is challengeable in court to contest federal jurisdiction but we are still in court litigating the jurisdictional question. One can only look with awe at an organization that is so focused on its self-defined mission to protect all waters that it would spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in litigation over years for the filling of a small dry home lot without a significant effect on the environment and without providing the landowners the most fundamental right afforded ordinary citizens to defend themselves against false accusations. If the new rule is adopted as proposed, it would literally cover virtually all waters and much of the land in the United States. Federal regulation of ordinary activities like the Sabbath, like the uh, Sacketts, attempt to attempt to build a home would not be unique. It would be a commonplace. As Justice Alito stated in Sackett, already the reach of the Clean Water Act is notoriously unclear. Any piece of land that is wet, at least part of the year, may be covered by the act, putting property owners at the agency's mercy. It is imperative that the high court safeguard a landowner's right to defend himself in court by challenging an untenable or dubious application of the law. By defining its own jurisdiction, 
as broadly as it has without any congress con clear congressional intent and even contrary to con congressional intent to recognize and preserve and protect the right of the states to control local land and water use, the, law, the, 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 the Corps and the EPA will essentially become a law unto themselves. This, I believe, is a breach of the public trust and should not be tolerated. Thank you very much. So let me ask both of you, um, since I don't think the, the core and the EPA are any about to kind of say, okay, fine, we'll just get rid of the rule. What, what do you think Congress should do? Um, obviously, they should have some legislation to withdraw the rule, but what else kind of moving forward? Uh, Don, what do you think? Well, if I were to start, I would probably not try to amend the Clean Water Act. And I think, you know, a lot of people have given a lot of consideration as to how to stop them. But, but I do think Congress should not try to, you know, likewise, I don't think Congress ought to write the rule for the agency. But I believe the agency ought to have to live by a certain set of principles. And that those principles, you know, and I think Reed alluded to a lot of those principles, you know, in his, in his talk. I think there's things that we can do to safeguard the public through a real important collaborative rulemaking that would, um, that would probably try to, you know, hem in the agency a little bit in terms of how vast their, their discretion is. So, you know, I think, I, think the I think Congress needs to hit the reset button, and I think they also need to provide some very significant principles that the agency can use in doing a rulemaking. Okay. And what do you think, Reed? I, I don't think we're gonna see any improvement uh, without some legislative action I think that the EPA and the Corps are institutionally uh, uh, unable or unwilling uh, to restrain themselves. And if there's any ambiguity in the law, they will use it to extend their authority. Just consider that the focus of the Clean Water Act is on navigable waters. It literally says, thou shalt not pollute navigable waters. And now we're talking about non-navigable waters. Absurd on its face. Uh, but, it, but this is the approach that the agency has taken. When the Clean Water Act, uh, known as the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, was passed in 1972, the Corps of Engineers said, we understand our, th our authority to extend to traditional navigable waters. That was the traditional scope of the commerce power at the time. But over time, the agency, uh, through accretion, gradually expanded its claim of authority and uh, found uh, some uh, courts that are willing to go along with this. Uh, the lower courts have often deferred to the agency's interpretation. Even though navigable waters should not be ambiguous, it was considered such, <clears throat> and the lower courts allow the agencies to, uh, to continue to expand. In, in 1985, in the um, um, Riverside Bayview case, uh, the Corps of Engineers said, we think that we can regulate wetlands that uh, are uh, adjacent to navigable waters. That made sense because these waters literally bled into the river. You couldn't tell where the water ended and the land began. However, <clears throat> subsequent to that, uh, they claimed that they could regulate virtually anything in the hydrological chain. And that's why we took the court, uh, or took the Corps and the EPA to, to court in the Rapanos case. And in uh, mm -hmm. 2006, the, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court essentially said you've gone too far. You can't regulate all waters. That should be clear. So I think that at, at the very least, what the uh, Congress should do is emphasize what it intended when it originally passed uh, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act in 1972 and then the Clean Water Act in 1977 or 79 and indicate that <clears throat> there, there are limits and explicitly state what those limits are. Whether that would be the, the traditional navigable waters, it's hard to say, but it certainly does not extend all the way up the hydrological chain. And uh, um, I, I think too that at the very least, because of the, of the, of the tendency of the agency to be heavy handed in its implementation of the act and particularly in its enforcement, there should be some built-in provisions in the act 
uh, that specifically authorize those who question the assertion of uh, jurisdiction uh, to go to court to hash it out and, uh, and challenge any overzealous uh, enforcement. This is what we're trying to do in some of our cases right now, uh, one now pending before the Supreme Court. But this is an essential part, I think, of, of clearing up the mess. And so just, you had mentioned the Hawks case before. Can you briefly mention that case? <clears throat> sure. Uh, <clears throat> the most common way for uh, the uh, court to assert its jurisdiction is through what's called a jurisdictional determination. That's essentially a wetland or other waters de uh, delineation. And when, when, that, when that is issued by the agency, it's binding on the agency, it's binding on the landowner, it's binding on the public. Uh, and essentially, if one is found to have jurisdictional waters on one's land, one cannot do anything with that, th th that portion of the property without federal pr approval. So the existence of a jurisdictional water on one's property essentially federalizes your property. It gives the Corps of Engineers or the EPA a veto power over, over, over the use of the property. Um, up till now, uh, th one could not challenge uh, in court uh, these jurisdictional determinations, even if they are demonstrably wrong. We are representing uh, clients in two cases that meet uh, that, uh, that fact pattern. One is called uh, Kent Recycling. Kent Recycling uh, wanted to uh, convert some property in Louisiana to a waste disposal site. They got a jurisdictional determination said you've got uh, jurisdictional waters here. They disagreed with that, appealed it in, in within the, uh, the Corps of Engineers, and the reviewing officer in the Corps of the Engineers said, you're right, this is a faulty jurisdictional determination. It's factually incorrect, it's legally incorrect, but when it was remanded back to the district engineer, district engineer issued the original jurisdictional determination without any modification whatsoever. We've taken that to the Supreme Court because the Fifth Circuit said that the, there is no right to immediate challenge to these types of, uh, of um, jurisdictional determinations. <clears throat> At the same time that this uh, that the, the Kent Recycling case is up before the Supreme Court, we represented a Hawks company in the Eighth Circuit, almost exactly the same fact pattern, where the reviewing officer said the jurisdictional determination was invalid, but the Corps, is Corps issued it anyway. But, ha but contrary to the Fifth Circuit, the Eighth Circuit has said that these jurisdictional determinations can be reviewed uh, in federal courts. So now we have a split among the circuits, and we've asked the Supreme Court to take that split into consideration and do its duty and resolve that split and tell us once and for all whether these types of jurisdictional determinations are subject to immediate review. If I could just add, <clears throat> The, the problem with having a jurisdictional determination out there that you cannot challenge is that it puts the landowner in a catch-22. The landowner has only three options. Uh, number one, <clears throat> they can uh, abandon their use of the property at great cost. They can seek a permit, which is estimated for an individual permit, to exceed $270,000 in two years in the process or they can go ahead with their use of the land and risk civil penalties of $37,500 a day and or incarceration. Those are no options whatsoever. So essentially, unless the Supreme Court declares that these jurisdictional determinations are subject to review, once the agency says you're subject to federal control, you have no redress. That is absolutely unacceptable. Thanks. Um, Tom, real quick for you. Um, in the definition of tributary, the agencies have made it clear that ditches are covered. Um, seems like most ditches, and the exception doesn't seems pretty narrow. Can you just explain why it seems like it covers almost all ditches? Um, the, the exceptions are ditches that do not connect to downstream waters and ditches that are dug entirely in an upland. And, and again, you know, I'm a country boy from Alabama. A ditch that doesn't connect somewhere downstream doesn't seem to compute very well. <laughs> and, and I don't know why somebody would dig a ditch along a ridgetop. Maybe there's reason. 
but I'm not quite sure I understand what they are. Uh, those are the two exemptions. Uh, the agencies have basically said that they've heard our concerns here and they're going to try to address that. Uh, if they do, I'm wondering if it's a logical outgrowth because they've clearly given every indication that they're going to regulate any feature that can contribute flow. And as Reed says, the volume of that flow, the frequency of that flow, the duration of that flow, or the proximity to that flow makes no difference. Yeah, in other words, uh, they're exempting ditches that don't exist. Right. Well, let's take some questions uh, from the audience. And please just state your name and affiliation and ask a question. And if not one, a comment, and then just kind of say, what do you think, what I just said. Um, so, uh, Marshall, you got a question over there? This is David Schneer. I'm with the Energy Environment Legal Institute. Uh, I'm wondering whether on a legislative change what, uh, you would think about uh, changing the primacy, the primary authority from the federal government to the state to define what's a navigable water since states already define what are state waters and whether you think there's any uh, legislative potential for that. Wow. Uh, that would kind of be a home run, I think. <laughs> um, The potential for that probably fairly low. Um, I, I think the 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 I think there's probably uh, you know a lot of I think there's things that are are doable and and things that aren't and that one would probably fall in the category of not. <laughs> Sorry. I think the Farm Bureau would be supportive of that approach, but uh, that's uh, but. That, that's a big, that would be a home run. The definition of navigable waters has been pretty stable for over 150 years, uh, meaning a, uh, uh, a channel on which you can float a boat and which is capable of use for interstate commerce. Um, and that, that, that readily falls within federal jurisdiction. If it's totally interstate, then I think one, an argument could be made that that's a state water. Uh, but hard to go any further than that. I'm, I'm Dean O'Drudy, and 30 years ago I worked for the Corps of Engineers and uh, now work for a different federal agency. Um, my sense in those 30 years is that the Corps, which was always conservative, didn't really want to get into this, this regulatory position, but was pushed into it by outside entities including elected officials and pressure groups. But the question I would have for you is, is this jurisdictional thing, whether or not they have the legal authority to do it, a regulatory taking? And as a regulatory, could you address it from that aspect as well as from the aspect of perhaps getting a court ruling that forever knocks down uh, these jurisdictional assertions uh, unless they really are beside bona fide <coughs> navigable waters, which my understanding is nine feet deep. But could you ex explain what a navigable water is? Yeah, that, well, that's a complex question, what constitutes a taking. Uh, <coughs> the uh, There's no question that once uh, a land has been uh, designated as including jurisdictional waters that it immediately results in a diminution in value. Uh, so far, the Supreme Court has not accepted a mere diminution in value as a taking. If it's a complete loss of value because the entire property is unusable as, uh, because it contains jurisdictional waters, then one could have an argument uh, under the Lucas case, the Supreme Court Lucas case, that this is a altogether 100% taking. Otherwise, if it's less than that, if it's what we would call a partial taking because some value is left or use of the property, then the courts engage in a balancing process. They balance the uh, impact on the, on the landowner versus the, the goals and benefits to the state. Usually that results in uh, a fixed 
kind of a, a fixed situation because the courts always rule that it favors the the agency and and not not the the landowner. It's also very difficult to uh, um, to finalize or uh, to prepare such a case for uh, um, for judicial challenge. We are always looking uh, for uh, to, to bring takings cases under the Clean Water Act or the Endangered Species Act, but typically the there's an exhaustion requirement that requires the landowner to seek a permit, have it denied, or have mitigation that they can't live with before they can even bring the case. So, and just just for a side note, <clears throat> when uh, <clears throat> in in that Riverside Bayview case that I mentioned in 1985, where uh, the Corps was claiming that it could regulate wetlands. Um, adjacent to navigable in fact waters, Riverside Bayview argued that, you know, it, it would result in a taking if the Corps of Engineers could regulate that broadly. And the Supreme Court at that time said, well, that's kind of a case-by-case -case analysis. We're not going to let that dictate our decision on this at, right at this time. So it's a complicated question. Can't answer it yes or no. Here. I have a question for Don. Don, is this on? No. Um, the the rule right now relies a lot about, especially the definition of tributary, relies on the ordinary high water mark. And I remember uh, years ago that the Corps of Engineers said, you know, ordinary high water mark is kind of a confusing term. We need to do a rule on what is ordinary high water mark. They've never done a rule on that. And now they're basing this rule on ordinary high water mark. Do you have any comments on that? Well, clearly, I think it is very key and an integral part of this rulemaking if they're going to use that as a determination of what <coughs> is a WOTUS or what is a water of the U.S. Uh, and they've tried to keep that outside of the rulemaking process to keep it as, I think, as broad as possible. Uh, I think it is part and parcel to the way they've conducted this rulemaking, which is to really kind of obfuscate what they really want to do and give themselves the broadest possible discretion. Um, I, again, whether it's their, their new guidance on ordinary high water mark or whether it's the old, you know, clearly if you're going to use terms that, that are going to be integral to defining what the regulatory footprint of the agencies are, that should be part of the rule. And, and it's not, and I think that's a violation of, of you know, even as, as Reed said, even the public's ability to, <clears throat> to see transparently where this rule is going to regulate, it's a, it's a violation of open government. You may recall that as the Supreme Court in Rapanos cited a 2004 GAO audit of, of district, uh, core districts and their inability to apply a consistent standard to identify the ordinary high mar water mark, suggesting that if you went to three different districts, you get three different answers on the same question. And so it, it just simply is not, um, there, there's no way that you're going to get a consistent application of the law using that as your standard. Other questions? Up front. I, I, let me also add, I, I am convinced there's nothing ordinary about the way they apply that standard. <laughs> if there's a line on the land left by water, that's that meets the test. And I, you know, from that standpoint, you know, we're just obviously I think that that shows at least in the minds of farmers and ranchers how you can go from regulating water and water quality to regulating land use. Yeah, well, one of the reasons I asked about that is that the origin of the term ordinary high water mark comes from the idea about where is water ordinarily, means in a typical year, in a normal year, under normal circumstances, et cetera. And so, and it's basically, if you look, water fluctuates, and you can see on the side of a bank there is an ordinary high water mark. What's happened here, it seems as if, is they're 
taking these physical indicators and they're saying, oh, if there's debris, that's an ordinary high water mark. But you don't know when that debris got there. You don't know that it's there as a result of an ordinary event, et cetera. So it becomes this, anyway, broad, unknowable, undiscernible. And isn't it true uh, that uh, the ordinary high water mark under this new rule does not have to exist all the way up the tributary, just in some portion of it? That's right. That's right. I'm Todd Gatziana from the Pacific Legal Foundation as well, and um, I was reminded, Don, when you showed the pictures, um, that uh, a couple of those pictures were shown at the Joint House Senate hearing. One of them from Tennessee showed one of those agricultural fields, and um, I, I think the administrator of EPA at least was was asked, or the the, the, the head of the Army Corps, whether that was a wetland or not and of course they said well that we, we can't answer that question if I remember correctly you know by a picture but if the real statutory definition is whether something is navigable a navigable waterway and there's criminal penalties for plowing a navigable waterway shouldn't you be able to tell whether a farm is a is, is a navigable water or not um, uh, do, do you remember, did I remember that uh, hearing? You did, and ultimately right. what they said was that under the current guidance documents, post Rapanos, where volume, frequency, and duration of flow, as well as proximity of that flow to a truly navigable water, made a difference that they could call that a water of the U.S. Now, what we've done is go to the Tennessee Department of Environmental Quality, and we've asked them, have you do you know of any instance prior to this determination of where the agencies have determined these features to be waters of the U.S.? And the answer is no. Uh, we've also gone to a number of, of <coughs> environmental engineers that are kind of dumbfounded that the agency, you know, sometime starting about end of 2013, beginning of 2014, basically said, you know what? We may not have been exerting jurisdiction over these features in the past, but we've got the authority to assert jurisdiction. So we're going to do it. Uh, I think there's some question, particularly in light of the two Supreme Court cases, it, both being isolated or whether or not, you know, there's, I, I don't want to say significant flow, but a significant nexus. We think there's limitations there. Uh, clearly, the agencies are being very aggressive right now. And, and, you know, they've got to ultimately support their thesis that this is only a clarification. We've had this authority all along. We question that, and really, I think the public deserves a, a pretty bright line as to what is jurisdictional and what isn't, and clearly they're obfuscating that in that debate. Real quick, let me ask a question. I just want to clarify and kind of stress the scope of the adjacent waters definition. And the idea that a water anywhere in a floodplain could be covered. Can you just kind of explain, like, how broad that really is? Give us an idea of what we're talking about here. Either of you? There, there is, th this is another example where um, the agency will take a normal term with general understanding and, and, ab and abuse it uh, to have a meaning. Uh, that's counterintuitive. Um, the Supreme Court has always used the term adjacent waters to mean abutting or contiguous. However, the regulation um, defines the term to mean neighboring as well. And that term neighboring is undefined. And in actual examples over the years, we've seen the core assert jurisdiction over, over uh, wetlands that are miles away from the nearest uh, navigable water, arguing that they are neighboring. Even if there is an intervening road or a ditch or railroad or the like. So again, we, we see that um, the agency introduces ambiguity uh, into the, uh, um, the regulation on purpose so as to allow the greatest 
leeway in defining what constitutes waters of the United States. This does a disservice to the regulated public because as I said earlier, it takes an expert to determine what, where the law applies and even then you can't rely on that expert opinion. Uh, I, I want to put a finer point on that and basically say that when you, what the agencies here have done is create a menu, a drop down menu. Uh, the first option is to look for any feature that could contribute flow. And if they can, they can obviously call all of those tributaries and waters of the U.S. Then their next option is, is there something close to it in their mind? Whatever close means, a country mile, five miles, ten miles, 500-year floodplain, thousand-year floodplain, or whatever, then is it close to one of those those features that could contribute flow to a downstream water. If it is, then it's adjacent. And then you've got this other category of other waters that by no stretch of the imagination could water ever flow or be associated with a navigable water. That's in these areas that are, that are highlighted here. Then they use similarly situated in aggregation and they say, you know, eh, isolated interstate doesn't mean a thing they're important, we're going to regulate them. Uh, th thank you, and join me in uh, thanking the panel.